achieved. Well, this seems like it's been absolutely forever since I had an opportunity to sit behind a microphone and discuss mixed martial arts. Um, yeah, with the COVID-19 pandemic surging around the world and the quarantine that's been imposed, obviously we've had no MMA until now, and as a result, I opted not to provide any commentary. Uh, just, you know, a couple things. Obviously, my wife's a nurse. Uh, I don't know if I've talked about that in the past. Probably not. So that uh, certainly puts us in the thick of things. And I've got a young family at home as well that I'm dealing with, along with trying to run my classrooms and educate my kids and everything else. So uh, we're doing our best. Uh, as far as mixed martial arts is concerned, I have mixed feelings. Obviously, I'm here. I'm going to be f providing predictions. I'm looking forward to the event because, honestly, the uh, lack of live sports has certainly been difficult, but understandable. And I know a lot of you are going through that as well. Uh, but uh, like when the first event was canceled, I was really disappointed that Dana White opted to push forward with uh, you know, his plans when every other major sporting organization was opting to put things on hold and to take into account the current the world dynamic and see what needed to be done. Now, I don't know if these events will actually follow through, these upcoming events that are going to happen in Jacksonville. We'll have to wait and see as of recording this. We're just over a week away and a lot can happen in a very short period of time as we recently found out. Nonetheless, welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. Uh, and on this episode guy? of Kamikaze Overdrive, I will be breaking down for you UFC 249, which will take place on May 9th from Jacksonville, Florida. I'll be giving you my five main card predictions on this episode of the show. All of my preliminary picks, as per usual, will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. I will also be posting a betting pack, as we will be able to bet on live sports once again, so very much looking forward to that. I've actually had some success if you want to go way back to uh, the last time we saw live action. The last UFC event, let's just quickly look it over. The last UFC event, um, when did it go down? March? 14th so over what are we looking at here april we're well over a month you know, closer to two months by the time we actually get this event uh since we've had mixed martial arts action uh my hbc betting prof uh, betting packs or my hbc uh packs have, have won three consecutive shows had profit and my cbc's have had two consecutive shows with profit so we'll see if we can keep that going we've got a like a stacked amazing card including two title fights to uh, build around for this event and we'll see how that plays out, and I will do my best to get out my prelim predictions as quickly as possible. And the two subsequent events the UFC are planning as well are going to come in short order, so we'll get fired up for that uh, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, if you want to follow me at, on uh, Twitter at KO underscore predictions, you can do so as well. And uh, on that note, and I haven't said this in a long time, let's get to that first main card prediction. Fight number one in the main card goes down in the UFC's heavyweight division. As the always controversial 5 and 2 Greg Hardy takes on the undefeated 6 and 0 Jorgen De Castro. Uh, currently looking at the odds, Hardy comes into this matchup as the favorite, uh, roughly in that area of minus 190, all the way to minus 210, depending on what sites you're looking at, probably higher, and we'll get higher as the fight uh, gets closer. For Jorgen De Castro, the turnaround on him was r roughly in that plus 180 range. Now, looking at this matchup and how it all shakes down, Hardy's coming off his first legit loss of his career obviously he had the Alan Crowder disqualification but he was outclassed and defeated by uh, Volkov in his last fight but it's a good experience for him absolutely for DeCastro he smashed Justin Taff in his debut in a bit of an upset brutal knockout finish still undefeated as his record indicates uh, with four of his six wins coming inside the first frame now for Hardy at six foot five the guy is a massive gargantuan heavyweight, five inches taller than DeCastro. He will have a six-inch reach advantage, and Hardy should push the limit at 265 pounds, coming in anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds heavier than his uh, opponents. He's also the younger man by two years. So Hardy is significantly bigger, and uh, all indications are he's the better athlete as well. So a lot of physical things going in uh, the former Dallas Cowboys' favor. Hardy is still a fighter the UFC wants to promote. we got to recognize that as well, despite his checkered past, despite the concerns. And that's why he's in a pay-per-view here. The UFC knows his name kind of sparks controversy, kind of you know pulls in the intention of other fighters that are not... Uh, or other fans who might not necessarily be UFC fans or casuals, and he's certainly... Uh, they want to capitalize on that. Um, also, it, he's a huge heavyweight. He's a good athlete, and he's big. He's very marketable as a fighter, especially as he starts to pile up the victories. And as he gets going, had he knocked out Volkov, that would have been a massive push for him right there, built around that. Um, it's also worth noting he's winless in two fights. 
And the UFC, I would think, is certainly looking to provide him with a matchup that'll get him back in the win, win column. And giving him a relatively inexperienced, undefeated opponent who's very beatable is a perfect opportunity for Hardy to capitalize. Now, DeCastro has faced about the same level or same um, amount of competition, but uh, I think that Volkov uh, fight for Hardy and the fact that he has more UFC wins are certainly experience advantages that he holds. Uh, and when you look at DeCastro, he hits very hard, as we saw in the Taffa fight. He's got some decent kicks, but he throws some pretty wide strikes that aren't overly technical, and he gets a little bit ugly as fights go. It could be argued that on his, his uh, contender's bout, he was losing right up until he won the matchup. Um, his skill set just isn't ideal to hold off a bigger, more aggressive forward-pushing Hardy. You know, he doesn't have that reach or that technical striking game to punish him every time Hardy comes forward. Unless he can blast him out of there in one shot, it's going to be in some difficult exchanges. Uh, there are some concerns that Hardy could slow down. You know, he's tried to be... He's still, you know, he's on baby legs. He's still trying to figure out, you know, how to pace himself, but still be aggressive and, and do enough damage to potentially score a knock or at least win a decision, but how not to push himself to the point where he exhausts himself and ultimately loses a fight because he gasses out. So the, but there is a concern that if DeCastro can survive the early flurries in the first round, he could take over and win rounds two and three. That's certainly a possibility. Uh, ultimately, I think Hardy's just a fighter that's growing. He's got a lot of potential... Um, he's got potential to flame out as well, but I think there is potential for him in this fight to show some of those skills that he's built upon. He's taking a sizable step back in competition uh, from Volkov, obviously, a fight he took on short notice. Uh, look for Hardy to continue to grow, benefit from that experience, benefit from the opportunity to fight here, and my prediction is uh, Greg Hardy to defeat Jorgen De Castro by knockout. Fight number two in the main card goes down in the UFC's featherweight division as the 28 and 17 Jeremy Little Heathen Stevens takes on the 20 and 4 Kelvin Cater. Both fighters are currently ranked in the division as last time I checked. Uh, Cater currently the uh, favorite at minus 225 all the way up to minus 250 with a return on Jeremy Stevens, and he comes in anywhere from as low as or as high or low as plus 175 all the way up to plus 205, and that number will probably continue to increase as we go. Now both fighters recently fought pretty solid level you know opponents and they both lost unfortunately now, this fight is a very key and influential fight for both of their careers to determine where they're headed if they're going to be allowed to continue fighting that upper echelon competition or they're going to take a further step back look at jeremy stevens who's been around for a heck of a long time he lost yeah rodriguez in a very uh, emotional bout he lost as a beat he lost to jose aldo he had wins for josh emmett and duho choi and goat melendez to get him into that position and now he's taking a bit of a not a step back but certainly he's not on the the streak he was for cater he lost a fight of the night to the same uh, aforementioned to beat magma shapiroff in a very good matchup previously he beat former title contender ricardo lamas pulled off a win against fish gold uh lost to hanazo moicano as well he had wins over shane burgos and andre feely prior to that to get him you know kind of raise his profile a little bit now cater's two inches taller he's got a one inch reach advantage now looking at cater first he's two years younger than stevens but jeremy stevens has a wealth of experience 46 pro bouts he turned pro in 2005 he has 32 ufc fights compared to just 24 total pro bouts for cater so cater certainly doesn't have the experience even though he's, he seems like a very experienced and veteran fighter stevens certainly has some mileage on his uh on his uh tires if you will but he's certainly he's one of these fighters who doesn't show it as much as some guys and he's still, still in there swinging uh cater turned pro in 2007 but he took a sizable layoff fighting between 2013 and 2015 i think he fought just once in that time span now jeremy stevens we're well aware of what he brings to the table he's got that big knockout power 19 of his 28 pro wins have come by knockout eight in the ufc Conversely, when you look at the rest of his record, he's 7-12 and 12 in decisions, 9-17 uh, and 17 when he, uh, he doesn't win by knockout. So certainly a sub, uh, well under 500 fighter when he can't knock his opponent out. Now for Cater, he absolutely has power. 9 of his 20 wins have come by knockout. He destroyed Ricardo Lamas. Fishgold also tasted as well. Took out Shane Burgos in impressive, impressive fashion uh, in his, uh, not his debut, but one of his early UFC fights. But the nice thing when you look at Cater's record, he's 8-3 and three in the scorecards. And his only losses... He's got two, you know, the two losses to Moicano and Zabit on by decision in the UFC. Prior to that, his one pre-UFC defeat on the cards came by split decision. So the guy's got, he's got game. He's got the ability to win fights. He doesn't score the knockout. Now, I don't want to dismiss what Jeremy Stevens has done. Stevens has made strides to be more diversified. He certainly has improved his offense. The low kicks he utilized against Gilbert Melendez were very impressive. They were a nice addition. But ultimately, he needs to avoid chasing the knockout. And it, it's a significant problem when he can't. And I find that once it kind of is determined that he's unable to match an opponent shot for shot, and he's going to struggle to 
or at least it's not going to be an easy, his game plan isn't playing out the way he wants it, he reverts, he devolves back to that headhunter, and over his last 11 fights, he has just two wins by knockout, so those numbers are concerning. For Cater, I would assess him as the more diverse striker, he's the more technical boxer, he mixes his offense up more effectively. You know, he showed he can hold his own against the beat on the feet, he landed 80 significant strikes a very talent, against a very talented uh, fighter, and he forced the Russian to use his grappling to negate some of those striking skills that uh, Cater brought to the cage. Now, Stevens, I'd say most likely needs a stoppage here. Or he needs to hurt his opponent on multiple occasions. He cannot afford to go shot for shot with Cater without doing some significant damage. Which is certainly an avenue for victory. I think Cater, though, has, is, a well more rounded, is the more well-rounded fighter. And he has more avenues to victory here. He can win a decision. He could... You know, score. You know, with his striking, with his volume, he could possibly hurt Jeremy Stevens, who has he was knocked out by Eve Edwards way back in the day. And he's been hurt a couple times. He was stopped by Jose Aldo with a body shot. We could see Cater working a little bit of wrestling, if possible. That's certainly something we've seen Stevens susceptible as well. Jeremy Stevens could go down that avenue and and work his wrestling game as well. But I just don't see him being the fighter to step up and make those adjustments. He just seems like once Plan A doesn't work, Plan B is just blast away and hope something lands. And there's no Plan C or D. Uh, look for Cater. I think he's a very smart fighter. Look for him to be very smart here. Avoid a firefight. Keep touching Stevens while avoiding the big strikes. And just after a first round that will be relatively close, I think Cater will start to piece him up a little bit. Find his jab. Find his counters. Find the timing of Stevens. Avoid those big shots. And my prediction is Calvin Cater to defeat Jeremy Stevens by decision. The Midway Mark uh, matchup on the pay-per-view is a dynamite battle in the UFC's heavyweight division. As former title challenger 14-3-0 Francis Ngannou top ranked contender, takes on the undefeated Yerozino Rosenstrike, who also comes in as a fighter on the cusp of an opportunity to fight for the title with a victory. Uh, looking at the current odds, we've got Rosenstrike as a sizable dog around that 2 plus 250 mark. Well, uh, Ngannou anywhere from minus 270 all the way up to minus 300 and beyond. Now, this is a big fight as the winner potentially will get a shot at uh, the title in the not too distant future, once the Stipe DC three fight either happens or is passed by, the winner of this fight matchup will probably be right there. Now, for Francis, he's three and zero after his title fight loss and post title fight letdown. And the guys he's beaten, it's it's been solid. He beat out Curtis Razor Blades, another guy who's basically showing he's right in the mix for a title shot. He took out a shell of Cain Velasquez, and then he stopped JDS, who had been making some moves as well and climbing the ranks uh, in a re attempt an attempt to return to the uh, title contention ranks. Now, in those three fights, he had a he had less than a combined two minutes and thirty seconds of overall fight time, which is you know something to take into account. He's been getting guys out of there quickly, but not overly tested. For Rosenstrike, he's coming off his fourth UFC victory. He's undefeated in ten pro, pro bouts. He had two very quick wins over Andre Arlovsky and Alan Crowder. Thirty eight seconds combined for those two fights. Um, he went a full five rounds, less four seconds against Alistair Overeem, which was you know crazy, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Now, both men are six foot four. Ngannou is five. Will have a five-inch reach advantage. He's five to ten pounds heavier. Uh, Rosenstrike is the younger man by two years. Now for Jerzino, Jerzino again. I'm probably mispronouncing that. He's had an interesting UFC career. He lost the first round against Junior Albini in his debut, and then finished him very quickly in the second frame. He had the two quick wins we previously mentioned. Then he almost lost the entire fight against Andre Arlovski. Or sorry, against Alistair Overeem. I had Rosenstrike to win that matchup, and I had a lot of money come my way when he did win that matchup. But he lost it, pillar to post, until the final couple seconds where he basically knocked him out. He had some moments, but, you know, the performance was concerning as far as I'm concerned. He didn't show a lot of urgency or the ability to change a game plan, and he was taken down. He struggled in some positions, and he kept looking for the same opportunities. And had Overeem not, you know, got a little bit tired, got a little bit vulnerable, and got ultimately knocked out, we're not even having this conversation right now. Most likely, we're seeing some another fight uh, materialize um, for both of these individuals now. You know, you also consider the fact that he, he knocked a guy out who has 14 career losses by knockout as well. So it's not like he, he cracked someone, some guy's chin that he basically broke down over a measured five round, you know, performance. It was a relatively, uh, it was a brutal knockout, but it certainly has an asterisk beside as far as the significance of his performance, what it means to his career. He probably loses the fight otherwise. That doesn't probably, he absolutely does. Now, Rosenstrike is an absolutely talented striker. He's got good skill, got timing, he's got power, obviously. He's a confident fighter. But he didn't have an answer for the more complete MMA game of Alistair Overeem until he, he did at the very, very last moment. 
Uh, is he a pure knockout artist that hasn't quite adapted his game to mixed martial arts? You know, there's the possibility. He has arguably lost every prolonged round where he hasn't stopped his opponent in abrupt fashion. He's arguably lost any long, you know, every every round he's fought in, he's lost with the exception of the ones he finished his opponent in. That's certainly something that's concerning. Uh, Angano has looked unreal since the letdown fight against Derek Lewis, which I'm going to dismiss because it was a post title fight letdown. He's finished multiple opponents very quickly. He did beat guys with a history of knockouts, which is concerning, or guys who are not in the greatest of spots as far as, you know, Cain Velasquez is a perfect example. That went on to pro wrestling after the defeat. You know, and Francis, he's a knockout artist as well. But, and he has that power, he has a varied striking offense, and he can he, he can be hit with some big shots, he hits guys with big shots, his chin has not shown to give up yet on him. And while he looked terrible against Derek Lewis, I'm looking past that. You look when he fought Stipe Maochik, Angano had a very questionable performance, and Stipe had to negate the striking and go to his wrestling and capitalize on that, something that Rosenstrike's not going to have to his advantage. Overall, Angano is the more capable fighter here. He's the more varied fighter. He has the more avenues to victory. Is Rosenstrike the better pure striker? Quite possibly, absolutely. But this is MMA. Is he the better MMA striker? We don't know yet. We, we're, I, I, I'm not ready, willing to, to stake that claim because there's more to MMA striking than pure striking. There's the elements of having to be prepared to defend grappling and clinching and all these different things that exist within mixed martial arts that don't exist elsewhere that you have to focus on and build your striking game around defending and, and dealing with. You know, I would say Rosenstrike's best approach would be to sit back and counter Francis. As he presses forward, use his aggression against him, land big shots, hurt him, back him off, make him start to question, see if he can get that deliberate uh, striking a, a game into rounds three, four, and five. Get Ro get Francis slowing down. Get the timing and possibly knock him out or at least pick him apart with uh, combinations. But Ngannou's chin, as I previously mentioned, has not been cracked yet. He's been hurt in fights. We've seen him take some shots. You know, he's not been perfect, but he's been pretty fucking damn good. And a heavyweight that can change in the blink of an eye, but again, we can't bank on that. The gap on the mat here in this is far greater, and that's what the concern is here. Francis will be absolutely dominant once they hit the ground. Rosenstrike had very little offer off his back against Overeem. He seemed lost at times. Had Overeem secured a takedown in those final final minute or so of that game, he pro of the last fight, he probably wins. It almost seemed like Rosenstrike he was either going to hang out and wait the round out and look to restart in the next round, or for the ref to stand him up. Had Overeem been more aggressive from the top position and been able to get to mount and, and rain down some big shots and not get tied up, he could have got a stoppage in that pos in that fight. Francis is also a submission threat. He had that beautiful submission over Anthony Hamilton the one time he submitted a guy in the UFC. He can score takedowns. He's been better on the regional scene when it comes to grappling and submissions because he hasn't had to rely on it here. But he absolutely could go there here. Look for Francis to exploit Rosenstrike in the mat. I think he's going to... He, he might say, hey, let's go mano a mano and throw hands. That's a very highly, you know, possibility. But I could see him looking to show his diversity and show what he brings to the table, take him down, and demonstrate his skills on the ground. Uh, nonetheless, I ultimately think we're going to see Ngannou look to uh, capitalize on the floor. Whether it be for TKO or submission, I think he gets it done there. My prediction is Francis Ngannou to defeat Eros, you know, Rosenstrike by submission. In the co-main event of the evening, we have our first of two title fights as the UFC's Bantamweight champion, Henry Cejudo, with a current record of 15-2-0. Takes on the former champion, the 22-2 returning Dominic Cruz. Uh, the current odds on this fight see Cruz as a plus 180, 190, 195 underdog, depending on what site you're looking at, where Cejudo is above minus 200, anywhere from minus 205 all the way up to minus 240, as far as I can see the range I'm looking at at best fight odds. Uh, now, Cejudo is making his first title defense of the Bantamweight title. He did defend his flyweight title versus TJ, who was the Bantamweight champion at the time, so an interesting dynamic. Uh, and he had that TKO victory over Marlon Moraes that captured him the Bantamweight title in a uh, to, to, when they were crowning a new champion after Cruz or after sorry after TJ had to be stripped. Cruz is coming off a loss to Cody Garbrandt when Cody Garbrandt captured the title. Uh, he did defend his newly won title for, after he took it from TJ Dillashaw against Uriah Faber. Won and again he beat Faber relatively uh, soundly, but ultimately the fight against Cruz was incredibly close. Now, Cruz is four inches taller than Cejudo. He'll have a four-inch reach advantage. He's only two years older uh, than uh, Henry as well. Uh, who tur uh, Cruz turned pro back in 2005. Cejudo didn't turn pro as a mixed martial artist until 2013. But Cejudo was wrestling at a high level all the way back 2005. So that's worth noting as well. Now, for Henry, he hasn't fought in 
uh, 11 months, I believe. Uh, for Cruz, he has not participated in mixed martial arts for a 41-month period. Now, Cruz openly doesn't believe in ring rust, which is <laughs> worth noting. And he has experience, you know, as far as that's concerned. You know, he fought DJ back in 2011, one of his bigger fights, one of his more impressive victories. He then returned three years later to take on Takeya Mizugaki. Uh, he then fought TJ 16 months after that, and he fought, you know, it was just a significant amount of, of breaks and layoffs for Cruz. Uh, even though both guys coming up layoffs, I think it's more significant. For, for Cruz, the layoff's longer, but he has more experience as far as dealing with that and returning from it. Cejudo's had a couple of 9 to 10 month breaks in his pro career, but he doesn't have, uh, you know, the quite... I like the grasp that Cruz have of how to prepare and how to get ready for a fight like this when you've been out of action for so long. So I'm not necessarily concerned about that. There is concern, obviously, Cruz is getting older and getting up there, and some of the timing and speed things might not be there. But it's hard to anticipate that. This layoff could allow his body to uh, rebuild itself and get, get healthy. Now, Cejudo has recently changed to a more karate-style-oriented stance and attack away from his wrestling. His wrestling is still there, but it seems to be a secondary aspect of his offense. Now, that being said, he's run into some issues. For example, when he fought Marlon Moraes, a you know a big bantamweight, he was having a lot of trouble reaching him early, and he was losing the early exchanges. He was getting tagged with leg kicks. It was forcing him to switch stances. In fact, he's had issues with leg kicks before. You go back to his fight with Demetrius Johnson, he had some issues. He was, his ankle rolled 30 seconds in the fight after taking a couple of leg kicks. So there certainly were some issues there with those distant strikes. Now, when he fought Marlon, he turned the tide when Marlon started to fade and ultimately crashed in round three. You know, that fight, because when Marlon started to slow down, that fight started transpiring at a closer range, whether it was, it was with wrestling or, on, or striking, Cejudo was able to get on the inside and find success because he started to fade. Against fresh fighters, we have seen some issues with length and variety and volume for Henry Cejudo. You know, DJ had a lot of success faking and fainting and drawing out Cejudo's offense and forcing him to react in a very close fight that I'm not necessarily sure I think D, uh, DJ lost. Again, I have to go back and watch it another time and I, when I'm not prepping and watching only Henry Cejudo, but still, it's, it was a very close cut fight. But you have to wonder, when you've got a guy like Cruz who uses the level of movement he uses, is that going to create issues? Is that going to make it very difficult for Cejudo to find him with relatively relative uh, uh, regularity? Now, when you look at the volume, Cruz's volume... Well, not super powerful. He's not going to one-punch blast a guy unless you're Takei Mizugaki. Uh, but he's, he's very active, he's varied, and he's, you know, over his last five fights to go the distance, he's landed 90, 60, 112, 87, and 80 significant strikes. Those are some pretty sizable, good numbers against championship-level opposition. For Henry Cejudo, just 51 against Demetrius Johnson. He did land 90 in the Marlon Moraes fight, but a lot of them were unanswered ground strikes at the end. He kind of pushed those numbers up. Three rounds against Sergio Pettis, just 36 strikes. Against Benavidez, over three rounds, 68 strikes. So he hasn't really shown us he can put up the ridiculous volume on a consistent basis, or that's that upper-level volume, especially against a fighter who might not slow down, who might not allow him to get in close. Cruz has great takedown defense, so you have to take that into account as well. He has been tested by multiple wrestlers. He's been taken down periodically, but not. it's very difficult to take him down. It's very difficult to keep him down. And while Cejudo's an Olympic wrestler, again, this is mixed martial arts. There's more to it than just that. We've even seen Cruz take down some very good wrestlers in his own advantage and in his own, uh, you know, giving him the nod there. And he, he will have a size advantage in this fight. It's also worth noting he's going to be the longer, taller, you know, arguably bigger man here. Now, if Cejudo can't close the gap with his striking... Because, you know, with Cruz's specialty of movement and distance management and the ability to just fake and faint, if, and if Cejudo can't take him down, that's going to make it very difficult for him to land offense. You know, TJ, a longer fighter than Henry Cejudo, with good wrestling in his own right and speed and movement and power, struggled to reach Cruz for long portions of that fight. And if Cruz doesn't drop off in rounds 3, 4, and 5, you have to wonder, will Cejudo drop off? At times in that matchup, people were criticizing Cruz against TJ, for moving towards his power left kick, I believe they were talking about. And then Cruz, it, it was almost like he was baiting him, and TJ started throwing it, and it wasn't landing, and you start to realize that, you know, more than more so than punching, leg kicks, especially high kicks, take a lot of energy out of you, especially when they miss. And you almost started to wonder, is Cruz baiting him? Does Cruz feel he has a pretty good read on it? And is he baiting him to throw those kicks and trying to drain his energy bar? And, and we saw TJ got more flat-footed, had a lot of trouble reaching him. And with Henry Cejudo, is that something here? When he starts swinging and missing, especially when he tries to flurry and move, close that gap, 
if he does that for two or three rounds, are we going to see him start to, to break a little? Are we going to see him start to slow down? Something he's capitalized in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other fights. So Hudo's not going to be bigger in this matchup like he was against DJ. Or he's not going to have better cardio like he did against Sergey Moraes. Those are two key things he's going to ha- he needs to have success with. I like Cruz to land just enough offense, but he's going to magnify it by avoiding a lot of what Cejudo throws. Making him swing and miss, making him chase, making him throw flurries, and avoid them. This could be a split decision. This could be a very close fight that you know could be dissatisfying for people, but I think we see just enough out of uh, Henry Cejudo being the bull and Cruz being the matador and countering and landing offense in his own right to warrant a victory here. This would be, I don't know if it's unprecedented, correct me if I'm wrong, please. This could be unprecedented seeing a, ch- a champion recapture his title for the third time when you consider the, the, the gaps, you know, 2011, 2016, and then 2020. That's very impressive. Nonetheless, my prediction is Dominic Cruz to defeat Henry Cejudo by decision, possibly split. Finally, we move to the main event of the evening in one of the most anticipated fights of all time. Almost. This is a great matchup. Let's not play it down, but it's not Tony Ferguson versus... Uh, Habib Nurmagomedov, which may never happen. Nonetheless, we're in the UFC's lightweight division as the 25-3-0 Tony Ferguson and the 21-2-0 Justin Gaethje go head-to-head for the interim UFC lightweight title with the right to face Habib on deck or after Habib Connor or face Connor or something. Um, coming into this matchup, Justin Gaethje is the current underdog around plus 165 and Tony Ferguson roughly plus or minus 170 or minus 190 depending on what site you're looking at. Now, this is a massive high stakes fight. It kind of that's, that goes without saying, even though I said it. Uh, and there are incredibly distracting circumstances surrounding all of it. You know, Ferguson could lose his Habib fight, fight once and for all with a loss here. You know, with Nurmagomedov having limited fights left behind him, you know, we would see Tony lose this matchup, obviously fall behind Gaethje, most likely fall behind Connor as well, and never get his opportunity to fight Habib, who might only fight a couple more times before his career is done. Tony comes into this fight having won 12 in a row, including 9 finishes. His last loss came all the way back in 2012. Uh, he only fought once a year since 20... He's only fought once a year since 2017. Um... And it's almost been a year since his last matchup, but the guy's been a monster, and we've been waiting for this opportunity for him to another, get into another high-profile title fight, even though it's not exactly the one we're looking at. For Justin Gaethje, he debuted beating Michael Johnson in a very entertaining matchup that cost me some cash. He lost to Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier, and again, incredible wars that kind of springboarded those two individuals into uh, bigger opportunities. But then he's since, he's had a trio of knockouts over James Vick, Edson Barbosa, and Donald Cerrone, all in the first round that have got him here. Physically, both guys 5'11". Ferguson will have a sizable 6-inch reach advantage, and Tony is 4 years older than Gaethje. Now, both fighters are dealing with the odd circumstances. It is hard to determine who is handling it better. If you put a gun to my head and said who's going to handle it better, i go with Ferg. I think Tony is just a little bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, more so than the average fighter. But that actually plays to his strengths here, because he will just seem to... I think he'll just dismiss the oddities of this fight and the circumstances, and he will do better. But keep in mind, Tony just cut to 155 pounds a week or so ago in preparation to prove he was ready for the Habib fight. You know, and then he's going to do it all over again. That is concerning. Is that going to drain his body too much where his vaunted cardio might not be there? Or will his body be more fragile than it normally is because of what he did? Or will it make the cut easier? Will he be able to maintain and stay low and then just make that last little lop off at the very end to get where he needs to be, where Gaethje's going to be struggling to get down to 155 and could be vulnerable? There's all kinds of questions. We really don't know. It's hard. Now, both fighters have a commonality in their styles. They are both willing to absorb damage in order to break their opponent. Very much different than Dominic Cruz we just spoke about. They're both willing to stand in there and take a barrage of offense in order to beat you. Which is odd. Now, Gaethje hasn't really needed to test himself over his last three fights. As I previously mentioned, three very quick knockouts. But he has used this style in his UFC time, uh, early in his career, and in his uh, uh, time in World Series of Fighting. It nearly cost him against Michael Johnson, got him hurt a couple of times, put him on the wrong end of the wars against Dustin and Eddie Alvarez, but he's used it to, you know, to his advantage at times. He has a lot of power. He has showed it. But it's also worth doing these last three victims have a combined 14 knockout losses, accounting for over 50% of their total pro losses. So it's not like he's blasting guys out of there that are unknown for being finished. Keep that in mind as well. Now, Gaethje is willing to shell up, eat big shots, take damage, dish out out damage in the same time, and he hopes you will fold because you're tired, because you're hurt, maybe a combination of the two, and you won't answer the bell when he will. Both Eddie and Dustin were able to avoid that and ultimately put him in the, you know, turn the table on him. Now, for Tony, 
His approach, that's a little bit different. He pushes an incredibly crazy pace, constant pressure. He is all over his opponents, moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. He'll eat shots, but he's going to force you to fight a fight at a pace that he can maintain, but you can't. You can do it for a round. Maybe you can do it for two, but you're not going to do it for three, four, or five, and eventually you will be dismissed by his uh, routine, aggressive pressure. He has put himself in some bad spots before because he's very offensive. Kevin Lee had him in all kinds of bad spots. Lando Venata hurt him a couple of times. He's been hurt and dropped, knocked into multiple fights, but he tends to rally. He tends to push, and, and it almost maybe plays into that where this guy's like, oh, we got him in trouble. I've got him where I wanted. Why is this guy still coming forward? Why is he hitting me? Why suddenly I'm not hurting him anymore? Is my opportunity gone? And before you know it, you're the one on the mat being choked out or fading and finished with strikes. Ferguson is not the type of fighter you want to allow to get rolling, start building up offense on you. He has that unreal cardio. He hits hard. He's got a long reach, good striking, good grappling. He just has a complete package, maybe short with some defensive, maybe short with some defensive uh, deficiencies. Gaethje hits exceptionally hard. He's got good wrestling in his own right. He's pretty durable. It takes a little bit to get him out of there. And Ferg doesn't want to eat big shots from him, I don't think, on a regular basis. So one of these guys might you know, need to change their game plan or ultimately make adjustments to, to come out victorious here. Again, I don't like the fact that Tony's put himself in the bad spots on the mat, again, against in Lee, but Gaethje is known for not using his wrestling, not wanting to get on top of guys and, and ground them and, and bust them up. So maybe he's not going to look for those takedowns. He's not going to dive in on, on guys who get overly aggressive and, and exploit their lower half to a level change and, and take them down. And maybe that's going to be to Tony's advantage. Tony is excellent jiu-jitsu, but I don't think you want Gaethje on top of you, even if you are that good at jiu-jitsu. Uh, Habib Ferg, Ferg has been a cursed fight, absolutely a cursed fight, and a Tony loss here all but eliminates that fight. It would be the cherry on the shit Sunday, if you will, eliminating the possibility of that fight happening. And, the, and for that reason alone, considering everything else we're dealing with in the world across the globe, that would just be one more are-you-kidding-me moment. Uh, not that Gaethje versus Khabib wouldn't be amazing, and I fight, would definitely tune in to see that, but Gaethje could one-punch Tony. He could hurt him, and then where other fighters have failed, swarm him and finish him. Tony, as I said, is known for his leaky defense. But more likely, the more likely scenario that's probably going to play out here is that Tony comes out, pushes that aggressive pace, Gaethje tries to shell up, absorb some of that damage, you know, work his way through those early exchanges, but the problem is Tony's not going to go away. And unless, unless Gaethje comes over the top with a big counter, fires you know, fires and, and lands something, it's just more aggressive, Tony's going to keep coming. And eventually Gaethje's going to fade. It might not happen until we get deep into rounds 3, 4, or 5. But Tony's going to keep pushing that pace like he's done to a lot of guys in the past. He's going to hurt him. He's going to overwhelm him. You'll see Gaethje, you know, his, he's, got, he's a good kicker, but those legs will get heavy. He's a good puncher, but those arms will get heavy. You know, he'll start to make, you know, just like we saw, if Dustin Poirier can finish him, and if Eddie Alvarez can finish him, Tony Ferguson is absolutely capable of finishing him. I would anticipate it would come strikes, maybe a possibility of locking up that Darce if he if Gaethje gets tired and goes to the ground. But my prediction is Tony Ferguson to defeat Justin Gaethje by TKO. So those are my five main card predictions for the UFC 249 event. Maybe we're seeing the event, maybe we're not. Either way, I'm looking forward to it if it goes down. Uh, all of my preliminary picks will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. You can follow me on uh, Twitter at KO underscore predictions. And, of course, my bet packs will be available. We'll hope to get back into the swing of things and kind of keep that little hot streak we had going over a month ago when we last saw live mixed martial arts. Uh, very much excited for the card. Do I agree with it going off? Not 100%, but I get the sentiment to a degree, and I will certainly tune in and be excited and enjoy it start to finish. I hope you do as well. I hope your families are well. I hope everyone is looking after themselves and uh, hanging in there and that we have better times ahead of us. Nonetheless, thank you for tuning in, guys, and I will talk to you hey, maybe in a very short period of time, maybe not for a long time. Take care. Hi.